Welcome, everybody, to this second webinar in the Wireless Innovation Forum's webinar series. Uh, my name is Lee Pucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum. I'd like to welcome you today to, to the webinar uh, entitled The Software Communications Architecture. We've got, I think, a great lineup of speakers uh, to, uh, to present to you today, and uh, I hope you get value out of the, uh, out of the event. Um, just a cute couple of administrative notes. Um, there's a question. If you look at your screen, uh, you'll see that there's a questions button there that you can click, and you can actually type in questions that you'd like to present to the presenter. The way we'll run these is the presenters will go through their presentation, and then any questions that occur along the way, I'll, I'll give to them at the end of their presentation, and we'll also have an extended question and answer session at the end. In addition, um, during the question and answer session, if, uh, if you'd like to personally ask a question of a speaker, there's a raise your hand button in your webinar controls. If you click that, it'll notify me that you'd like to be unmuted, and I'll, uh, I'll turn your microphone on so you can, you can ask a question of the speaker. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce the first presenter today, uh, Andrew Tech, and the title of his presentation is the SCA and FPGAs, and uh, Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Lee. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, welcome to my presentation, first presentation this afternoon. As Lee said, my name is Andrew Foster. I'm a product manager for Prism Tech Spectra SDR middleware product range. The agenda for my presentation today looks like this. Uh, first of all, I'm going to provide some background to the problem that we're trying to address. Then I'm going to look at some of the current ways FPGA components have been integrated into SDR applications, particularly focus on the SCA's MHAL and contrasting it with alternative approaches that companies such as uh, Prism Tech are promoting. The second part of the presentation, we'll look in more details at uh, Spectra IP Core Orb, which is Prism Tech's geo uh, processing core for FPGAs, before providing some final thoughts and conclusions. FPGAs have become a key enabling technology in software-defined radio. They're typically used to provide IF and crypto functions, but some of the later generation of more powerful devices have been used to realize DSP and also GPP tasks. Some of the specific benefits they provide include, well, they offer um, more flexibility uh, in terms of rapid prototyping and reduced time to market when compared to uh, things like the uh, developing uh, applications using the ASIC fabrication process. They can much more easily be reconfigured to handle new functionality, unlike custom ASIC solutions. FPGA hardware parallelism means that FPGAs can now exceed the processing power of uh, sequential uh, DSP ex execution for specific scenarios, of course. Uh, Non-recurrent engineering cost of ASIC de design far exceeds FPGA hardware solutions. And also, a hard implementation of an application in FPGA tends to be more reliable than a software program executing on a GPP or DSP. And also, obviously, with being able to run a, a processor core and DSP functions on, on an FPGA, you can potentially remove the need to have these, uh, you know, an additional GPP or D, uh, DSP processor, uh, potentially having a more uh, less power-hungry uh, solution. So in the context of the SCA, what, 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 what's the objective here? What we really want to achieve is to be able to seamlessly integrate waveform components, no matter where they reside, including in hardware on the FPGA, but at the same time main, maintaining compliance with the SCA. As you're probably aware, the SCA defines a set of COBA-based APIs for hosting components on GPPs. However, the current version of the SCA, which is a triple two, basically assumes that the more specialized DSP and FPGA process environments are not COBRA enabled, and communication with these devices should be via a thing that we call MHAL. MHAL stands for the Modem Hardware Extraction Layer, and this is a lower level interface standard defined by the SCA. Prism Tech's contention uh, is that it would be much preferable to be able to use a common communication uh, mechanism right across the signal processing chain and we are proposing that this could be based on a, on a high-performance COBA variant. 
And in fact, with the next version of the SCA, uh, which has been worked on currently, it's called SCA Next, um, which you're probably aware of, uh, already in draft form, um, the, the new spec is starting to address um, uh, or starting to act, um, to uh, standardize um, COBRA uh, 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 across more of the signal processing chain, for example, SCNX will introduce a lightweight uh, COBRA profile for DSPs. And uh, in, in, in the context of the SCNX uh, work, there has been some preliminary work to define a COBRA profile for FPGAs with the intention that in, in future revisions of the SCA that there will be more standardization for COBRA on the FPGA as well. The current, uh, this slide actually shows what the current SCA device model is. Obviously, for components that are uh, living on the uh, communication between components on the, on the GPP, they're talking COBA. For communication to endpoints that are either on the FPG or DSP, these go via MHAL interfaces. DEMO provides a low-level API by which waveform components can interface with each other and with the underlying transport mechanisms provided by the flash platform. In order to communicate with a process and host and a HAL component, a COBA MHAL device proxy component is hosted on a GPP with a port on the, on the COBA proxy component connected to the HAL endpoint on the specialized hardware. Now, although this provides a degree of portability, Current, the format and content of the control and data messages sent to the HAL component, the HAL endpoint, are not standardized, and the waveform developer needs to basically get involved with the, it, developing the, uh, the, the, the format of these messages. Um, this approach, we believe, has a couple of obvious limitations. First of all, um, the ML approach still requires a waveform developer to write custom marshalling message handling coders, I've just said, and therefore, uh, we think this is a less portable uh, solution. And secondly, the use of um, a proxy core robots like the MHAL device hosted on the GPP introduces additional latencies into the communication chain. So basically, the following slide illustrates the, um, th this point. Now, on the GPP, uh, the MHAL defines a thing called the MHAL device. It's got a users and provides port. If a waveform component needs to talk to a, um, an endpoint on the GPP or on a DSP or FPGA, it does it via the MHAL device, uh, via um, uh, one of these port interfaces. So it uh, communicates uh, with the MHAL device via COBA, sending an, 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 MHAL, uh, an MHAL message. And the MHAL device itself is used to route the, the uh, message via the uh, via, uh, MHAL MHAL call to the appropriate endpoint. The net effect of this is that you obviously have a, you have, or you, you can have a call between the waveform component and the ML, ML device. The first call is the COBA call. Then obviously there's a routing message going from the ML device to the, uh, to the, to in this case the FPGA uh, logic via via the MHAL interface. And obviously on the return path, if you need to receive data from the FPGA in this case, you have an ML call back to the MHAL device and another COBA call from the MHAL device back to the, uh, to the waveform component itself. So you have, uh, if you did do it, uh, transmit and receive, you potentially have four call hops here. Our proposal, or what we believe is better, is that if you could basically be, um, if you can, um, talk uh, GEOP directly into the FPGA, then you remove the need to uh, have a, go via this uh, level of indirection or this route and via the device proxy. Uh, if you can implement the, the R interface directly on the FPGA, then you have a mu much more direct uh, and unified mechanism for accessing uh, components on the FPGA. So basically by Having a, the FPGAs and a COBRA enabled environment, we can potentially at least reduce uh, some of the additional call hops that you have to make if you're going via this uh, MHAL device approach. So the proposed, um, or our prism text proposed uh, device uh, model looks more like this. So what we want to do is be able to run a, a you know a lightweight, high performance. 
over communication, not just across the GPP and the DSP, which is, you know, um, people are not now are using COBA more readily in the DSP environment, but extending that right up to the FPG as well. So to this end, you know, over the last few years, Prism Tech have been developing uh, as part of our software-defined radio range of products some advanced middleware technology to support this type of approach. Originally, we developed uh, embedded software orbs uh, based on COBA -E and minimum COBA for the GPP. Uh, we've uh, pioneered uh, running COBA, lightweight COBA on the DSP. And more recently, we've been developing uh, IP core technology uh, in the form of our product we call Spectra IP Core for processing GEOP messages in hardware for FPGAs. We think this approach has significant benefits. For a start, a unified and fully standardized communication infrastructure can be used throughout the signal processing chain. This has significant potential impact on improving overall waveform portability. It also minimizes the call latencies in the system by removing the requirement to use component proxy sources on the GPP. So the next set of slides, I'm going to look more detail specifically at our IP core geoprocessing technology. We call it Spectra IP core orb or iCore for short. I'm going to start by looking at the architecture of our core, which are geoprocessing core for FPGAs. On the slide you can see here, components in yellow are provided as part of the of the core. Uh, components in blue are actually generated out of our IDL compiler that we provide. It generates um, a mapping between IDL and VHDL, or generates VHDL. We have a, the transport block itself provides an interface between the underlying hardware communication fabric and the ICO core. We also generate out the IDL compiler. We also generate out the IDL kind of thing called the top level entity. Basically, for each specific design, once you generate out the uh, the, the the additional VHDL to, to link into the core, it provides all the uh, automatic wiring of the core to the to the buses and to the entities that will reside on the bus. It's a bus based architecture. We have a one on the a bus on the input side, and one on the output side. The core itself implements the geo transfer syntax used in COBA messages. Communication, as says, occurs over buses. Internally, we use a protocol called BIOP. It's something that we've created. It stands for Bus Interoperability Protocol. Incoming and outgoing messages arrive and leave through things that we call bridges. And the bridge provides, provides a protocol translation between BIOP and GEOP. So um, the incoming and outgoing buses uh, consist of addressing data lines and read and write lines. So, for example, an incoming message arrives at the receive bridge that performs the protocol conversion between GEOP format to the internal BIOP uh, format. Uh, so that's when so the core receives the message. It does some pre-processing, for example, things like doing any engine operation, extracting the he headers, and then routes the message to the correct entity or object on the, within the within the core. If the reply message is expected then ICO core will handle the packaging and dispatch of the reply. Outgoing messages, on the other hand, are handled via the uh, transmit bridge, so it does the reverse. It converts between BIOP to GEOP. Um, servants uh, uh, process it at most uh, once, one request at a time, and this rule is enforced at the bus level via arbitration logic. And the arbiter implements a priority scheme in order to ensure that one client is chosen in the case that you have multiple you know, client requests coming and arbitration component handles all that. To support buffering of messages coming in from the transport, we have FIFOs on the input and output bridges. Um, the other thing is the uh, process of messages is meta-driven. So we have meta-driven uh, instructions, if you like, are generated for the IDL compiler for each design, for each interface. So this basically tells the core how to uh, process each type of request. The benefit of this is that in terms of um, resource consumption, logic consumption, you only take the hit for the specific interfaces that you're trying to implement. The core itself doesn't have to know how to translate every combination of, uh, of possible requests. Because of the meta-driven approach, we try to keep the logic consumption as minimal as possible. We also provide some things called we call the GPIO. This mechanism allows clients and servers to communicate with each other uh, on the bus and also provides uh, access to on-chip resources. 
without the need to speak. So internally, with between entities that are communicating on the bus, they're not speaking core, but they're speaking uh, 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 biop. In terms of current performance, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, currently, uh, with the with the current implementation, uh, we we're running the I core core between 100 and 125 megahertz. We can support data throughput between 350 um, to 400 megabytes per second. Uh, to implement a sort of a basic interface on a typical FPGA takes about um, the core plus the generated code takes about 3,000 logic elements. For each additional inst inst instance of the interface, it only takes a very small additional fraction to implement additional instances, so it's quite efficient. Um, in terms of what that means into throughput in terms of COBA messaging times, to give the guys on the phone who know about COBA messaging, to implement, say, a, like a simple interface which passes in a, a 1K payload as a, as a two-way uh, two operation as an in parameter, from the, the time to process from the first byte hit my code to the last byte of the reply message going out, it takes about two microseconds. So this executes many hundreds of times faster than it would with a conventional software orb. As part of ICO's ideal compiler implementation, we've defined a mapping from ID, ideal to VHDL. Uh, it provides direct, direct mapping between COBA primitive types in VHDL. The mapping requires a bus-based architecture, and as part of the mapping protocol, we've uh, as part of the mapping we've designed defined define this protocol BIOP, bus interoperability pro protocol, and basically within the uh, within ICO we can convert between GOP to BIOP. BIOP's the protocol that ICO uses internally to support requests and replies between hardware entities on the bus. Data is exchanged on, uh, on the bus in the form of messages, and we basically have three types of message. You can do request, uh, we can do one-way request, and we can have reply messages as well. The messages themselves consi consist of header and uh, optionally data if you, if you pass in data as part of the request. Data is placed on the bus uh, with an address offset from the target entity's base address. The offset itself is a constant that's generated out of the ideal compiler according to what uh, the rules of the, our language mapping. So just to give a, an illustration of how uh, you would implement an interface and how easy it is with ICO, I've got a, a basic uh, basic example here. Um, so the, des the, des the design flow is the same as uh, a regular uh, development a regular COBRA interface. You basically start by defining an IDL file. You generate right out the template code for the stubs and skeletons. This time it's, it's in VHDL. You fill in your business logic. You connect it up with the transport, and you either test it in simulation first, and then fit it, synthesize and fit it, and deploy it. So for a basic op, uh, interface like this, where we've got two operations, one that's sending data into the FPGA, the other one is reading data for the FPGA, you run this IDL file through the IDL compiler. You get a couple of different templates generated out. The first template, this is a section of it, basically provides some hooks in the file itself for you to basically uh, put your own code. You now, when you run this, obviously, uh, you, you fill in your business logic where in the, the, in, within the dashed lines, the, uh, the data is actually presented to you very easily like this. You've, you, you've got access to the data already. So to implement the first operation is, is trivial or you have access to that long value that's been passed in. On the second operation, which is actually reading the long value as well, again, another file is generated out like that, uh, VHDL, and there's a place in the file again where you get access to, or basically you can uh, put your business logic, POPs connected up to the GPIO lines to the internal uh, logic within the, within the FPGA, and pass that long value back across the Cobra interface very easily. So to implement something like that, providing your transports plugged in can take minutes. So, I, I, uh, IRP Corb implements a profile of Corb. It's a subset of functions. It's not uh, it re required or uh, required to, to support GL, uh, request processing. The current version of our product is at version two. It supports GOP version one protocol. We can do things like uh, one-way and two-way Corb operations. You can have uh, it can support clients and servers within the FPGA. It has, currently has uh, limited support for outgoing COBRA requests from the FPGA to a DSP. You can basically do static one-way calls. In the next couple of months, we'll have full outgoing call support. Full one-way and two-way operations are, are supported for incoming requests. Uh, the compiler support, 
we implement a subset of the, of the ideal language matter, although it's quite a rich submet, subset. We, we support all of the main keywords, things like import, module, interface, etc., and then a subset of the data types that are required. We believe are the common data types that are required in the FPGA. So all of the, or the most of the, the primitive types support for more complex types like struct and sequence, and you can even define things like exceptions, system exceptions and user exceptions on the interface. Um, there's obviously a pluggable interface to allow you to connect it up to whatever your hardware fabric is for the for, to support different types of transport. It's written in VHDL, it's very portable. And we're currently supporting a range of devices from Altera and Xilinx with more to come in the coming months. In terms of standardization, before I finalize, summarize, um, as I said, SCA222 uh, assumes that um, FPGA and DSP is not a COBRA enabled environment. STNX is extending the uh, coverage of COBRA, first of all, in the DSP environment, and hopefully into, in terms of standardization, into the FPG environment as well. Through the STNX working group, the SO consortium have made some recommendations already about an IDL subset uh, of data types that could be supported on the FPGA. We think, probably without an additional standardization at the OMG first, things like the IDL to VHDL mapping, Currently, this is, for example, it's, it's a proprietary mapping that PrismTech has defined. It's not an OMG standard. Without that, and possibly the standardization around the, the actual functional profile, probably through the OMG again, it's, it's unlikely that there'll be any more standardization within SCA next until that happens. And we're in talks with the OMG to make that happen. So for my final slide, I'd just like to summarize of, uh, what I've discussed this afternoon. Talked a little bit about how and how is, uh, the objective it is to support application port portability, and it certainly goes some way to, to support uh, application portability within the SCA, but with some limitations, particularly with respect to things like it forces the, uh, your waveform engineers to get involved with some of the low-level protocol d uh, details. It uh, adds um, potential additional latency by uh, routing messages via the ML device. By using a GEOP protocol a processing core on FPGA like ICO, we think you know we, this is, um, may have advantages in terms of the, providing direct SCA, uh, access to SCA components via COBRA on their hardware. It's a more architectural consistent approach right across the signal processing chain. You can get rid of um, uh, when well, you don't have to use MHAL. So I think overall it's a more portable solution because a lot of the messaging details are already defined as part of the COBA standard. You don't have to get involved in the low-level details. You can remove the need for having a, like a, a, a proxy which handles the routing through the through the MR APIs, and so reducing your uh, call hops. Um, and basically, by using the standard IDL uh, design approach or the, co the COBA design approach with, uh, with support for things like an IDL co to VHDL compiler, it's much more easier, in our opinion, to, to develop interfaces to components that are in the FPGA. And obviously, this has benefits in terms of how easy it is to integrate the functionality within the signal processing chain and the time to market for new SDR applications based on the SCA. So that concludes my talk this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who's listened to it. Um, if you need any more information, um, obviously you're going to be answering questions at the end of the, the presentation, but you can visit Prism Tech's website and we've got plenty of information about our uh, IP call for FPG as well. So thank you and I'd like to hand it back to Lee who will, who will forward you on to the next speaker. Thanks. Good afternoon. Thank you, Andrew. Um, again, a reminder for everyone, if you do have a question, please use your question window to type it in and then we'll, uh, we'll address the questions at the, at the end of the session. Our next speaker is Juan Pablo Zamora from CRC, and Juan is going to be presenting on uh, an intro to the SCA and APIs. Um, Juan, I'll uh, turn it over to you and let you take over. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, first, uh, apologies for my uh, late arrival. Uh, things are uh, complicated at the beginning. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, can, can you see all the slide, uh, uh, the first slide? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, perfect. So, uh, I have uh, very little time to um, uh, ex uh, try to introduce uh, uh, the, the architecture. Uh, this presentation is uh, focused on uh, people that it's uh, brand new to the SCA. 
Uh, we have uh, four uh, topics uh, uh, on the program, and uh, I'll run over them in the next uh, 20 minutes. Uh, let me start with uh, what is at the heart of the specification. Uh, and it is a component-based development approach. It means that um, the instantiation of the SCA is about making components interact to each other, uh, with each other. And um, the way uh, uh, it presents itself is about uh, creating in individual pieces of behaviors and then uh, assembling them together uh, to obtain uh, a bigger uh, functionality out of uh, the combination of components. Uh, the concept is not new. We've been doing this for quite a, a, a while. Uh, it's just uh, uh, maybe the, the, the terminology, the, the, the label component-based development uh, uh, might not be um, as uh, understood or as used as uh, it should be, but we've been doing this .NET with uh, Microsoft or, or Enterprise Java Beans uh, with Sun, uh, the OMG Corva component model. And, um, well, the SCA is a component-based development uh, architecture as well. Uh, so the idea, again, is to be able to create components, individual pieces of behavior that uh, will be like a black boxes. We will have a specification about what they do, about how can we interact with them, about the interfaces, the operations that we can invoke onto them. Um, we will have as well in that specification what are the requirements for those components, and that's basically it. Uh, once we have the component, then we will be able to assemble it. Now, at the heart of uh, uh, the component-based development paradigm, we have two items that are extremely, extremely important. One is the component model itself. It's uh, the set of guidelines or, uh, and rules that will drive how we create components. And uh, the second portion is a runtime support infrastructure that uh, will give life uh, 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 to those uh, components and uh, will enable the operation uh, uh, um, of uh, those uh, instantiations. Uh, now, the SEA provides us both, and uh, today I'm going to uh, uh, talk about uh, those guidelines and uh, also at runtime how things uh, behave. So how I was saying, a component is uh, it's to be viewed as a black box. Um, it's supposed to hide uh, how the component was implemented, but explicitly it says how we will interact uh, with it. Um, what else? It has to be a, an executable uh, piece of code that uh, we can instantiate in a processor. Uh, designed, implemented, and tested as a unit um, before it is used in an application. Uh, and we, again, it comes back the concept of assembling those uh, components together um, to give uh, a, a life to a, an application. Finally, components are supposed to be predictable, reusable, replaceable, upgradable, extendable, so on. Uh, while we're building those, uh, defining those components, uh, a key piece, it's about uh, the interface, uh, interfaces that that component will uh, either require or uh, implement. They, has to be, they have to be crystal clear uh, uh, in terms of uh, those interface definitions uh, because those interfaces will become contracts uh, down the road uh, when we want to assemble those uh, components. So uh, this is uh, 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 an example of an SCA application. We have an FM single band uh, waveform, and uh, you see a bunch of boxes in there 
And uh, well, all of all those boxes are individual pieces of behavior. All of those boxes are components. We have a component that will filter voice, another one that will uh, inject uh, the, the, the scrolls, uh, a modulator, an app converter. Again, each of those pieces has a very, very well-defined uh, behavior. Each of those pieces was built, uh, tested, independently of uh, uh, the interactions with uh, uh, all the other boxes. Once I have or we have all those uh, uh, individual components, then we assemble them together and eventually uh, we will instantiate all those boxes, but now as part of an SCA application. Uh, specifically about uh, the SCA, uh, we have uh, a bit of history here um, created for the U.S. Department of Defense, the Joint Tactical Radio System, um, but most important here, uh, this is this is one of the most important. This is the second bullet. It's one of the most important uh, uh, pieces of uh, uh, or focus of the architecture. The goal is to facilitate reuse of waveform applications, and uh, this this is wired all over the specification. Down the road, we'll see the difference, and I'll highlight. Uh, how uh, the SCA emphasizes in making waveform application, applications portable uh, across different radio sets and uh, not that much about portability, about the support infrastructure that will give life to those uh, uh, waveform applications. Uh, the SCA, for those of you uh, uh, listening that are new, um, uh, to the SCA, this uh, it has been called uh, like the SDR operating system. It's not. Uh, we all know that there is a, an actual real-time operating system uh, on which uh, uh, the SCA will run on top, but uh, it is obviously a key piece um, on software-defined radios. Uh, a very, very important piece as well uh, with the SCA is that it, it has been defined as, as a component-based development uh, uh, architecture that is independent of the application domain. What do we mean with that? Well, uh, <clears throat> we mean that whenever we specifically use a set of uh, uh, well-defined APIs, then uh, the, the SEA is used in one uh, specific domain. So when using JTRS APIs, then we will be creating JTRS waveform applications. But what happens if we decide uh, to use different APIs? Well, nothing prevents us from using the SEA um, to implement applications in the robotics field or for the automotive uh, domain. And, uh, uh, once more, nothing on the SCA, the core specification, uh, nothing uh, says that it's to be used uh, only for software-defined radios. It is a component-based development and uh, as such it is uh, defined to interact with any uh, piece of uh, uh, software component, any pieces of, uh, of software components, and uh, thus we can use it uh, in any domain uh, that we want. Graphically, this is how the specification uh, looks like. We have uh, at the bottom the hardware, uh, the digital portion, the RF, uh, um, portion as well, then we have a real-time operating system uh, that will enable us uh, communication with that hardware, and uh, then we have the software that uh, we will need to have in, in, in our platform. We have, um, I'll, I'll go quick and say, uh, uh, different colors, blue boxes, 
uh, it's going to be the radio management uh, um, uh, component. We have the green boxes, the SEA devices, and we have the re uh, red boxes, uh, which will be uh, basically our waveform applications. To communicate uh, through all of them, uh, we will use uh, a middleware, CORBA in this particular case, and uh, <clears throat> there is also uh, uh, the last box that is the application environment profile uh, that is a subset of uh, the POSIX uh, specification that allows uh, SEA applications to directly talk in some cases to the uh, real-time operating system. So uh, let me talk about uh, uh, those three functional groups uh, and their APIs. First one is uh, the radio management, and we have those blue boxes. We will have a domain manager, device manager, an application factory, and an application. Uh, green boxes, we have devices. Those devices can be devices, or loadable devices, or executable devices. Finally, we have applications. And uh, I'll go over the uh, functionality of each of those groups. Uh, but before I do that, this is how graphically things would look like in, in, in uh, um, an SCA radio. Uh, we will have a single domain manager. To the left, we will have the handling of the hardware. We will have one device manager per node, which will be managing as many devices as needed. Um, then we will have to the left, so, sorry, to the right, we will have application uh, factories uh, that will enable us the creation, the instantiations of uh, uh, waveform applications. Again, and the red boxes will sit either on the right or the left, depending on the view that we uh, would like to put here. But um, I'll be specific on each of those ones. So let us start with uh, uh, the, the red boxes, the SCA applications. Well. Those and uh, this might be the most important. Well, one of the most important components uh, in terms of the SEA, because uh, as I was uh, saying at the beginning, the the specification is wired to make these guys portable, because those are the ones that will make up our way from application. So, the a, a resource can be viewed as a hardware component, but at, at the end, it, it's a software component that, that will have an input, an output, uh, control ports, and uh, very important, it needs to be connected to other components. What other components? To other resources or to other devices? Um, whatever that component needs uh, to behave as uh, originally defined. Um, those components, they can be as complex or as, as simple as uh, uh, the designer wants. Um, the portability, though, will be impacted by uh, how complex or uh, simple that um, uh, uh, breaking of, of the behavior is done. Um, what else? Uh, we have here, and this is uh, the first API that we'll uh, look at, we have uh, a resource that inherits from other uh, APIs. Um, and uh, again, this is, remember, I'll emphasize component-based development, and uh, we will have individual boxes that we want to connect. We, we want to wire them together as assemblies. Well, we will have operation get port, for example, that will enable us to obtain a port for that uh, uh, particular component so we can establish connections. Who will establish those connections? Well, the support infrastructure, the blue boxes uh, down the road that we will see uh, soon. What else? We will want, as a component, we will want to have a control, and actually the specification requires the, the, the blue boxes to enforce um, the life cycle of the component. So we will have a couple of operations to either initialize or release uh, when we want to kill the component. What else? We want to have access to the internal values of some variables for those components 
So we will be able to use operations configure and query for uh, any SEA component. Uh, finally, there is a, a, a fourth interface that uh, uh, the resource interface inherits, and it's about built-in uh, run tests, uh, built-in tests that we can invoke to run. Uh, the last one, uh, generic behaviors that we want implemented in all components are operations start and stop. Um, as uh, the listeners can see, all those uh, operations have been generically defined. And uh, so far, they have nothing to do with uh, um, uh, radio uh, communications. Uh, again, they can be used with any uh, domain that uh, we want to do, uh, uh, use component-based development. Uh, second group, I'm running short on time, uh, devices. The key piece here is, in the diagram on the, on, the, on the right, is that we want to have waveform applications eventually interact with hardware components. But those hardware components, sorry, with those uh, hardware devices, uh, the waveform applications, they are forbidden from talking directly with them. In the middle, we will, only, uh, we will always need a proxy representation of those pieces of hardware. So uh, the SEA defines three pieces, devices, uh, any generic type of device like modems, uh, uh, the audio device, a GPS receiver. We will have loadable devices where we can load uh, bits uh, uh, onto them. Usually loadable devices are uh, mapped to FPGAs or DSPs. And finally, we will have executable devices. Those are usually mapped as uh, GPPs. Um, I already said this. This is the device, the, the, sorry, the API for devices. Uh, the, the, the basic operations are there to uh, allow usage of the device and control how it's being used operations allocate capacity and deallocate capacity will tell us about um, uh, the, the, the usage status of the, the device. Also, we will have um, attributes where we will be able to store uh, different uh, values as uh, the operational state, administrative state, or the usage state as well. Um, a loadable device will be a device that on top will have operations load and unload. Executable device will be a uh, loadable device, obviously a device, but uh, with operations execute and terminate added uh, to them. Final group, uh, two, two, two minutes, uh, final group is uh, the radio management, the blue boxes. This is the support infrastructure that will give uh, 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 live uh, to the SEA uh, waveform applications. So we will have four uh, components there, domain manager, application factory, applications, and device managers. Uh, the domain manager is the key piece, is the heart of the specification. And uh, he will have uh, functionality defined that uh, will enable the whole radio uh, to operate uh, uh, and applications to be instantiated. Uh, I'll just skip, um, apologies, uh, short on time, uh, to the API. We can see the operations that we can invoke on the domain manager, registration of devices or services, and the key here, installation and uninstallation of applications. So we will, be, we will define our assemblies, our waveform applications, and then using the domain manager, we will install them on the platform. Um, next blue box, the application factory. This is the one that we will use to invoke the creation, the instantiation of a waveform application. Uh, the application uh, blue box is just a placeholder to store uh, information about uh, the application that is being deployed. 
And finally, the device manager is the, the, the responsible for booting uh, the node and for launching those uh, proxy representations of the physical hardware. Um, uh, the good thing is that you will have the slides uh, um, to go take a peek. Uh, operations for the device manager, uh, registration and unregistration of devices, um, the shutdown of the whole node if uh, needed, and uh, I'm done. Uh, summary for this short, very short presentation, um, a key piece of the specification, the SCA is about component-based development. We develop components and we assemble them in uh, SCA applications. The SCA is independent of the application domain are highly wired to make waveform applications portable and um, that ecosystem of components is divided in three functional groups, devices, applications, and uh, the blue boxes, the radio management. Uh, thank you uh, all and uh, Lee, back to you. Thanks Juan, appreciate it. Um, our next speaker for today is James Essick with Reservoir Labs, and James is going to talk on Stax compliance testing with RCheck SCA. And James, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, James, we're not hearing your audio. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. So uh, this is work that uh, that we did with that I've done with Jonathan Springer. This is work being done by Reservoir Labs. Um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is uh, an introduction to static analysis. So I understand this is a this is a topic that is, is somewhat separate from the FDA. So uh, I'm going to assume very low level knowledge uh, about static analysis. I'm going to introduce the topic. Uh, then I'm going to talk about you know, what's going on in the in the state of the art uh, in, in static analysis and and how that relates to the FDA and uh, you know what what it is I think that's going on in the world that, that may provide value to people in the FDA developers in the FDA community. Um, then I'm going to talk finally a little bit about RCheck FDA, which is a technology that we're developing. You know that's attempting to take uh, some of the good work that's been done in static analysis, some of the lessons learned over over many years and bring it to uh, a, a solution that's tailored to the, the needs of the FDA community. So a little bit about an introduction, just as an introduction to static analysis. So when we say static analysis, what I'm talking about is a method for finding bugs through the inspection of code. So this is a, an approach to testing that is complementary to uh, more traditional runtime testing where you actually run uh, a product, run a radio or an operating environment and, and, and observe the behavior. With static analysis, the objective is to, to be restricted simply to the, the actual text of the source code. So that includes the source code, and as we'll see for SDA, also includes other text components, such as uh, Corva IDL files or um, XML files, uh, domain profile files, that sort of thing. Um, Static analysis, in contrast to runtime analysis, offers some advantages that make it a good complement. Uh, it's capable of analyzing all the program paths without bias. So with runtime testing, you, you only can test what you run. Uh, but with static analysis, uh, you're able to look at all the code, um, regardless of whether it's something that executes one in a hundred times or something that executes every time. Um, it can be run on code in an intermediate state. And, and this means that you don't have to actually compile and build the system uh, to use it, it can actually be run as the code is being developed. And that can be a potentially enormous advantage because you find bugs a lot earlier. You can find bugs before they even turn into working code. You can find bugs even as they're being written, as we'll see with the, with the FCA. Um, it also is something that can integrate directly into a development environment. So this is something that developers can use, as I said, actually as they are, as they are developing code. Oh, so what can it do? So it can provide reproducible automated tests. So you can track the state of your, of your system and get a picture of, you know, as you're closing bugs, as issues come up, um, you, know, you, have a, you have a mechanism for doing that. It can explain 
specification. So when violations are found, it has the potential to come back and explain what you did wrong. So for a specification like the FDA, which, which is fairly complex um, and evolving, um, it, it, it has a mechanism to, to, to essentially engage in a dialogue with the, with the developer. It can also answer what-if scenarios in more advanced forms. So you can, in, as a form of testing, you can posit you know, scenarios, you know, could my radio do this? Could this happen to me? You know, this provides a mechanism for doing that, which is, which is more difficult to set up in a, in a runtime environment. And it can generate counterexamples. So when something goes wrong, it can provide more detailed information uh, than you know, segmentation fault you know, might uh, about what actually happened and, and how, you, how you could correct it. Um, there are limitations. So you know, depending on how the specifications are written, some problems are very hard. And I'll be, I'll be talking a little bit about that. But there has been significant progress in, in recent years in tackling some of the hardest problems that are out there in static analysis. And I think that, that those solutions have implications to the FDA. Um, as far as infrastructure, uh, you obviously have to have the source code. But you know, one of the things we'll say is that, is that the, the technology, these techniques tend to work best in an environment, uh, like a compiler-like environment, where you have a, 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 a tool that can break code down into data structures. So just a little bit about the history of the field. So I realize you know, the, the people have varying degrees of familiarity with static analysis. This is a field that's been around a long time. Um, so you know, the, first, the first bullet, you know, this is you know, 30, 30, 40 years of development. I'm, I'm condensing this into a, a fairly brief talk. So I, a few things are going to be glossed over here. But um, it really starts with, with Gary Kildall back in 1973. So this is, you know, if, you're, you know, if you work in programming languages, the Popple conference is one of the one of the premier conferences. This is this is from Popple One, and what 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 he discovered was, or what he derived was, uh, a set of a way of, of reducing properties that you might be interested to in about a program to a set of equations. So for programs that loop, uh, then obviously the equations become mutually dependent. You so you solve them through uh, a fixed point iteration over a lattice. And what he what he determined and proved is that the solution you get from solving those equations using elements from lattice theory actually corresponds to the solution you want, which is you know, what the program is actually going to do, the facts that actually hold. This is really the foundation of modern compiler-driven optimization. So this is you know, basically translates immediately into things like live variable analysis and use before depth detection. This is, this is you know, one of the foundational results in the field, sort of the, the flux capacitor of data flow analysis of what what makes data flow analysis possible. Schroeder and Welly, a few years later, extended that framework uh, to, support, uh, to support data flow through procedures. So the notion of context, which, which relates to the arguments that you might pass to a function, um, so that you could do analysis on programs without having to effectively inline all the procedure calls. So another level of abstraction there. And then more recently, um, you know, work uh, in the field of model checking. So this is a, a term you may have heard. Um, you know, it's another form of static analysis, a you know, much more advanced form in which logical sentences um, are constructed in, in some formal logic, and they're checked against uh, an abstraction of a program, typically a you know, cryptic structure or some variant of that. Um, and this was this was Turing Award-winning work from a, a few years ago. So this is something that the community of of computer scientists, at least, has recognized as, as having been a, a substantial foundation. The takeaway from this is that this is a field with a deep history. It's not just a, a, it's not just a bag of tricks or um, simple search and inspect. There's some deep math that goes on under the hood here. Um, some successes from the state of the art. So again, um, these are, this is just general work that's out there. Um, and so for example, people have looked at the problem of trying to find locking, locking operations over the Linux kernel, so the precise checking of lock-on-lock -lock sequencing, um, and there they use you know, abstractions and 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 constraint you know constraints to model uh, branching behavior, but the techniques ultimately scaled to enterprise you know, Linux kernel-sized codes, and was very successful when this was done. I think around 2004, 2005, um, and found hundreds of previously unknown errors uh, with a very low rate of false positives. Of false positives. Other work in the field uh, in counterexample. Uh, guided abstraction refinement, you know, which, which was a, a big leap forward in model checking to automating the process of constructing the abstractions, uh, which had been a bottleneck, the so-called state explosion problem. Um, and you know, you know, extremely recently, this may have showed up in your in your mailboxes, you know, as, as, as short as a week ago. 
uh, you know, work on proving program termination. So program termination, the so-called halting problem, it was one of those you know, sort of classic problems that you know, where if you want to try to prove that a pro whether or not a program terminates, um, you know, it's, you know, a provably undecidable problem, but but hasn't hasn't stopped people from from trying to make progress on it, and uh, they have made progress. So uh, they're now getting usable results on hard problems. You know, I have a, I have a picture here if you're if you've ever read um, Gertel Escher Bach, you know, the classic you know, the classic book. Um, you know, they talk about records that break record players. So the idea of a program that no matter how good your program termination algorithm might be, there's always some program out there that breaks it. And so um, you know, this is this is obviously just a, a very hard problem. But these things relate to the FCA. So you know, what I've done here is I've I've pulled out a couple of FCA requirements um, and and just provide a little bit of commentary on them in terms of what's required to try to statically test them. These are all things that are being tested manually now. I, I pulled these from the, the the JTEL application requirement list. They're all being tested manually, which is to say, with a combination of of, of some static tools and manual code inspection. So a simple one, you know, just a simple Appendix B requirement from the FCA 222, which provides restrictions on, you know, basically the core POSIX requirements and what your which function calls you're allowed to use. This is fairly straightforward, and it can be addressed with 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 simple search and inspect tools. But it's something that really benefits from context-aware parsing. So if you have tools, for example, that can emulate the preprocessor, that are aware of syntax that are library aware. So, you know, in many cases, developers will will override uh, the the core POSIX calls with their own implementations, which is allowable under the FCA specification. Having tools that can distinguish that because they're you know they they have par effectively parsed the program is an advantage. Another another requirement, um, just relating, you know, again, this is a you know a very simple you know single sentence type requirement. Uh, that that file accesses have to be done through core framework file interfaces. Um, you know, deceptively simple because it's a very simple statement, but it's actually non-trivial to test. To test it statically, what's really required is an is an enumeration of what you're not allowed to do. Because what you're really checking for is you know is the code doing something that's in violation of this. And you know, for for waveforms that are written in C or C plus plus. That requires an understanding of all the different ways in those languages in which you could try to get around this requirement, right? writing to a file. So there's you know, the C function calls that do this, you know, write and read, et cetera. Um, but also in C++, things like string streams, et cetera. And then we get to another requirement. You know, again, this is a single sentence you know, pulled from the specification that the release object operation shall release memory uh, allocated by the component during the lifetime of the component. This is really a holy grail level problem because what you're talking about here is trying to demonstrate that all of the memory that may have been allocated is in fact deallocated um, when the release object is called. It's a very simple and intuitive thing. It's obviously you know a, a property you'd like your 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 software to have to hold, but it's very hard to get right, and it it, it requires a very delicate balance between eliminating false positives. Um, and eliminating false negatives and the speed of the analysis. You want something that finishes in you know reasonable amount of time. And it's really requirements like this that open the door to some of the deepest types of analysis that are available today. So just a couple examples of why this is a, you know, a really hard problem to give you some sense of it. Um, these types of things you know, where you just even want to talk about memory leaks in general, which is you know, really what the APO 7.5 requirement is, is getting to. Um, you can see you know, a couple of examples that I've pulled, and there are others. Um, you, know, you can do some devious things in code, right? By having, for example, in the, you know, from the first example, um, you know, by having a second malloc, you know, just immediately follow a first and effectively overwrite a pointer, memory disappears. Uh, in the second example, you know, where you have mallets and freeze that are conditional on 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 uh, on some uh, on some predicate, um, you have to be able to correlate. You know, was you know was predicate A true when I got there, and is predicate B true when I get there, so that I know that I've you know, allocated and deallocated memory in, in pairs. Um, these these require some depth of analysis, as I'd mentioned some previous work with the Linux kernel. Keep in mind, I mean that that work, which is a few years old now, um, you know that's an open source, you know, open body of code. It's an open book. You know, thousands of people had an opportunity to look at that, and still you know, many many undiscovered bugs were found. Uh, in locking operations, which is essentially an exact analog of this problem, except you, know, you just replace lock and unlock with malloc and free. Um, and the takeaway is that a, you know, a safe, conservative, 
uh, analysis really requires these sort of analysis tools. Um, for the SCA, static analysis isn't just limited to C and C++ source code. So again, it also, it also uh, reflects on XML. There are requirements, I pulled one here, that relates to XML domain profile files. And so you want to be able to analyze those and prove those are current. Those are also candidates for static analysis. Again, something that's more difficult to check at runtime. You may also want to uh, analyze Corva IDL files. You know, they, they define contracts uh, with the source code implementation. And then you may also want to check consistency requirements across file types. So yeah, you know, what is you know, the, the components that are defined in the XML and have their interfaces defined in IDL should be implemented correctly. And all of those things should be in accord with one another. Um, that's a very difficult thing for a runtime tool to, to determine, but you know, a very natural thing for a static analysis tool to look at. Um, and then obviously non-SDA non properties like memory leaks and pointer usage, you know, API usage requirements, you know, if there are particular sequencing rules. You know, these are the sorts of bugs that, that really do creep into code. So you know, if you're using you know, the, you know, a, a tool or a development environment that auto-generates some of the code, you may feel good about that. You know, those, you know, there, are, there are some very good products that are out there that, that auto-generate code. But where the developers are filling in the code, um, you should, you know, it's, it's definitely a point of concern. So this is a little bit, just to, to sort of wrap, begin to wrap up here, uh, a little bit about what we're doing with, with our Check FDA. So our goal with this technology is to take you know, some of the work that's out in the field, um, you know, the successes that people have had in different, in all different domains in static analysis and try to bring it into the FCA community and develop a technology that um, allows FCA developers who may not have a lot of expertise in FCA and, or in, in static analysis and, and, and maybe aren't interested in becoming experts in static analysis, but take those ideas and be able to bring them to bear on, on the complexity of FCA development. So this is, this is a technology that we're developing to automatically check these requirements. Um, it's based on a compiler infrastructure, so it's structure and context aware. It already provides C and C++ support, POSIX and CORBA. Uh, it has the sort of intermediate representation that supports both analysis of the type system and the, and the sorts of abstractions that are necessary to apply the more advanced techniques, um, support for, for XML and IDL. Um, it scales to enterprise level code. So again, this is, this is, you know, this is one of the key elements in, in discriminating sort of ready for prime time ideas versus, versus um, you know, perhaps things that need a little bit more investigation. Uh, you know, the, the, the ability to um, scale to enterprise level code. So you know what our experience is is with with our check the waveforms you know the types of waveforms that get submitted for for use you know, we're seeing you know on desktop hardware analysis times you know anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes uh, with operating environments you know scaling up to you know we've seen 90 to 90 minutes to two hours. But the goal is really to, to provide a push button level of support for SDA tests. Um, and you know, when I mention these runtimes, uh, well, let me. So, in terms of workflow, the way the workflow works is you know, we try to we try to, as best we could to mimic uh, a compiler. So we're analyzing source code files one at a time, the same way that a compiler does, and building up information that we bring together into a report. And it's because of this that you know, this is the type, again, what I would mentioned at the beginning, is the sort of technology that can integrate into a development environment. Um, you, know, you can actually, you know, in the time that it takes to you know, compile an individual file as you edit it, get back at least some initial information about where you might be in violation with the FCA. So you get that sort of instant response. You know, one of the times I would mentioned before, the end-to-end -end times of analyzing an entire project, and they track roughly with the time it would take to compile an entire project. Um, but individual files, you can get this sort of almost instant response. Beginning to look ahead to the SCA next, you know, it's just something that you know, we, we begin to take a lot of interest in. Um, you know, it's becoming apparent, you know, at least to us, that, that we think that static testing is going to become an even more integral component uh, with SCA next. There are, there are some new analysis, new challenges that you know may make dynamic analysis harder. You know, more flexibility in the interface. CORBA versus non-CORBA, and, and flexibility and the capability supported, you know, which may make it a little harder to build a sort of uniform test harness, um, and, and, and issues just in terms of accessibility to, to individual components um, once, they're, once they're built. 
but also opportunities. So again, a, a static testing tool is something that we think can really be used, you know, not just to, to say that the code is correct, but also to teach the specification. Um, and, and you know, the last comment I'll, you know, I'll make on this is, you know, as far as SCA Next, is that providing meaningful guarantees uh, really requires an accord among the specification authors in terms of what the specification says, the testers, you know, what tools are available in time and precision, what can be tested, and then in some cases also the developers and how code is written so that, you know, you, in other words, you're not, you're not pressing records that, can, that break the record player. You know, and, and there are, it really requires a, a synergy between all of those groups in order to, to provide a, um, in order to be able to provide meaningful guarantees so that, you know, if you're compliant, you know, there's value in that. Um, so what's possible? So again, with our Check SCA, we've, we've begun to develop it with SCA Next in mind, and, and you know, our goal is, to, is to, to be able to bring that forward to SCA Next. Um, what we're really excited about is the ability to provide deeper analyses, so adding, you know, more sensitive, more precise analyses uh, to to this and really try to find errors you know, that are deep and that, and that have an impact on how long it takes to, to certify and deploy technology. Um, and we think we have the, the platform to do that. Uh, and then also to provide an interface, you know, our, one of our goals is, is not just to provide this push button solution, but also to provide something that allows the developer to interact in a deep way with the technology, that, uh, with the code that they're writing. So you know, the idea, and these are things motivated by the model checking community. You know, we we won't expect people to write logical sentences, but we can certainly allow people to write natural language sentences, and then on, behind the scenes translate them down and apply these type of techniques, so that you might actually be able to ask questions about what the radio might do. Um, that's my presentation. Again, uh, this is this is work being done by Reservoir Labs, um, and uh, thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Lee. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, if you do have a question, please type it into your questions window. Um, and with that, we'll move on to our last speaker. Our last speaker is Daniele Omisani from Celix Communications. And he's going to be talking about design of multi-platform SEA compliant software components. And Daniela, I turn it over to you. Okay, you can see my slides. Yes, and we can hear you as well. Okay. Hello to everybody. My name is Daniel Misani. I'm a software design leader in sales communication. My presentation will provide an overview on how the weapon portability concept uh, will be extended in order to support the reusability of software components in heterogeneous platform environment. This is the topics of this tutorial. First of all, we'll we will present the software components and standard reusable products. After this, uh, we will see a specific case study based on the file system framework model presented in the SGA presentation. Uh, on this model, we identify several platform requirements. We identify these requirements in profile. After that, uh, we allocate component features to this platform profile. Following this allocation, we'll see several examples on design implementation issues in order to identify a general domain anatomy of the software components. We will proceed. Uh, in terms of reusability, uh, a software component might be considered a standard product, independently on the form of uh, the sum, <laughs> on the form of the implementation of the software components. Uh, such software components mm, should be implemented set of features that match some platform requirements. The design of this component needs, needs to be oriented in order to be reusable, in order to reduce the, after, the, the effort in adapting this component. Uh, the driving concept 
for this is defined by S3 specification in the term of waveform portability. The waveform portability uh, regards the possibility of porting a design time of waveform application, but the same concept applies also to platform components. This goal is achieved by SGA specification by definition of several architectural elements. So the elements are the application framework, the core framework specification, the identification application environment profile in order to abstract the underlying operating system, and the definition on a connectivity middleware, the core technology. Also, the standardization is also achieved by the specification of several APIs, for example, audio port, serial, and other basic API. The industry experience from this year has identified that the component boundary identified by the waveform portability is too wide in order to enable an efficient component reusability. It needs a more detailed design in the section. This is, uh, will improve the efficiency in the architectural reusability. This goal uh, deals with the decomposition of the boundary of the component identifying the SGA in functional module. Uh, the component reusability is supported by uh, some design concepts that we'll see after in the case study. This concept are the modularity that deals with the decomposition autonomous identities, the connectivity through the interaction and the middleware technology, scalability in terms of resource consumption and managing, and extensibility in deals with the improvement of the basic functionality. We look at this concept in detail in the following examples. We will introduce the case study of this tutorial. Uh, the case study is related to the use a, as an example the file system framework specific in the JTRS specification. Uh, this case study covers these following topics. First of all, we introduce the general model of the file system frameworks. We identify some requirements of platform profile. We will provide the example of the requirements for the platform profile. We will analyze the component features that we, we want to achieve in the design of the file system framework. And then, after these analysis, we will look at some example of design implementation issues that we will cover in the implementation of this file system. Of this file system. The main goal is to identify common approaches for common design in order to improve and reduce the cost of the component that is a bit in different platforms. Okay. Uh, this is the general model of the file system framework identified in the SGA specification. Uh, these are based on three main components: the file, the file system, the file manager. In relation with some of them, uh, component pi represents a single file or folder. The file system represents a portion of the on a native file system, and the file manager represents a federation of different file systems. Following from the specification of the SGA, we take a look on, on which platform we want to implement this file system. We identify, as an example, three possible uh, platform profiles. We identify an embedded profile which include the platform with limited hardware resources and limited functionalities, a distributed profile which include a platform which with heterogeneous processing environment with a, a larger set of functionalities, and a secure profile that will extend the other profile with security related functionalities like encryption, authenticity, and so on. Our file system implementation should support all the requirements of these identified platform profiles. Uh, 
After the identification on our platform requirements, we will proceed on the identification of the features that the file system should implement. We identify three major classes of uh, component feature. We identify the entry features that are related to the storage of the information, control features that are related to the processing of the information, and boundary features that are related to exchanges of information. And this is the user idea with the interface support and middleware technologies. Uh, this slide will provide a detailed example of feature analysis. Just to take a look, uh, we can see uh, that we identify three major controller uh, uh, features that should be detailed in uh, read operation, write operation, and query operation. We identify the backend support. Uh, for example, we will support uh, several backend. Uh, Meti POSIX file system or other implementation of file system. We have a support, uh, several uh, supporting languages in uh, heterogeneous environment. We have several different implementations on, uh, on our file system components. As a final step, the identified component features are located on the platform requirements. Uh, we will provide a sample of the allocation. For this allocation, we will be able to identify several, uh, several design issues. We will provide four examples of issues. And OK. Uh, the second example is related to the separation of concern in the implementation of a read-only file system and a read-write file system. Another example of design issues is related to the support of the heterogeneous environment. And this is related to the supporting a different programming environment and connectivity mechanism. Another example is related to the uh, possibility of plug a new functionality on existing file system implementation. The last example is related to the support of different backend implementation of file system. OK. Uh, now we are looking at some detail in this example. Uh, in uh, our example, we will use this high-level component model design. With this uh, model, model design, we identify um, three major modules that implement our component. The first module, the shell module, implements the, uh, the container, uh, sorry, the boundary mechanism that is able to interface the component with other components the agent component that implements the uh, control logic of, the, <coughs> of our file system, and the context component that implements the internal states of the file system and internal data structures. Uh, the first example is related to the implementation of read-only and read-write file system. In this case, we extend the agent file system implementation with two different classes. One related to the supporting of only read on, on only query and read operation. And while in this class, the other operation are started with, a, for example, throwing exemption. And the complete file system implementation edge control will be implemented with a read-write class with a specific class that use the read-only file. In this way, the implementation of the file system interface will be separated into different independent components and we enabling a component reuse. In the second example, an example, we will provide an example of design that support different backend for the file system. In this example, 
uh, we extend the logic of the file system uh, agent in order to support a backend adapter interface. In this way, the backend adapter interface will be specialized for each uh, file system implementation, for example, a native file system using POSIX library, or where needed uh, an SQL library that for implementing the memory buffer file system and so on. Uh, in this way, we can plug different file system agent implementation uh, that supports different backend without change our design. The next example is related to the support of the connectivity between the components. In a uh, heterogeneous environment, we, are, uh, we have components that need to communicate with heterogeneous system. In this example, we can extend the boundary components of our file system, in this case the file manager interface, with different uh, adapter and components. Uh, in our example, we can have different adapter based on different technologies. One may be the combo midware, another with adapter on a custom communication, and also we can support native uh, calls. We can support the communication between components using direct calls or using specific adapting technology. In this way, we are impacting only the boundary part of our file system implementation, leaving the agent implementation independently from this support. The last example is related to the uh, plugin or new functionality. Our example is related to the security exemption of uh, a file system implementation. In this case, we are extending also the file system agent, so the control part of the, our file system implementation. Following the example, we can uh, implement a specific agent which support security functionalities and we delegate the basic behavior of the file system implementation with another file system agent. In this way, we are able to add several new functionality reusing the other uh, component implementation. Putting together all of these, uh, for example, we can derive a general component model uh, in this component model, we can uh, we can find the key topics, uh, the key design topics on which we can uh, provide solution for different kind of problem. In this case, we identify three major components: the shell, the con uh, the context, and the edge components. That identify several design issues related to the information processing, information uh, communication, information storage. These components might be extended dependently on the usage. For example, uh, the shell module might be extended in order to support different connectivity mechanisms. The agent module may be supported in two different ways. With implementation modules that provide different behavior dependently for the implemented features and the adapter modules that should enable the usage of different uh, backend implementation or code library. This is, is used in order to enable to the scalability of resource usage. In conclusion, we can put a summary on this presentation. We can, uh, the key points of this presentation related to the, to consider the software components portability as a, a design architecture achievement. This design achievement is main focused on the 
uh, on the domain analysis of the uh, component model. This domain analysis is related before on the feature analysis of the model and then on the architectural analysis on the component in order to resolve a specific uh, design issues on the implementation of the platform requirement. Uh, these uh, follow different implementation challenges that will be resolved with architectural elements. We identify three in architectural elements, the shell implementation that is related to the connectivity issues, the modules implementation that are related to the modularity and the extensibility of the features implemented, and the module adaption that are related to the interaction and adaptation of the component model in different platforms, different operating environments. Uh, this is all for this short presentation. Uh, thanks to all. Thank you, Danelli. Um, at this point, I'd like to open up the, uh, the uh, webinar to questions from anybody in the audience. Um, you can either type your questions in, or if anybody would like to uh, raise their hand, there's a button on your screen which allows you to raise your hand, and I'll turn on your microphone so you can ask a question personally. So are there any questions from the audience? So um, I, I don't have any questions coming in. I have a question I'd like to ask uh, just the, uh, the panelists in general. Um, you know, given everything that's been discussed today, where do you see the SCA going from here? Where do you see these technologies evolving over the, over the next year or so? Um, any, anybody have uh, any thoughts there they'd like to share? Hi, it's Andy Fossey here from Prism Tech. I think obviously, um, the next big change, I would say, is that, uh, that everybody's sort of looking towards and trying to understand what the implications are going to be, both from the vendor point of view and obviously the end of view user point of view is is with the rollout of a, of a major new revision of the SEA specification because there's some, um, uh, certainly at the mid this point, there's some fairly major uh, changes that are going to, going to occur as part of the specification. I think that has an implication on um, certainly has an implication on uh, sort of legacy applications, how people will develop in the new generation of applications, um, the technologies that will be used within the SCA going forward may well change as well. They're taking a more of a, um, a, a technology neutral approach with respect to. Um, Boba, for example, is, is one of a series of technologies that may be used within SC Next. Within SC Next, it may not be the only one. You know, so other middleware, newer middleware technologies may st start to um, be used within the standard. So there's quite a lot of change potentially coming, and so uh, you know everybody's looking to understand what that's going to mean. Thanks, Andy. Is there are there uh, any other thoughts? I'll jump in. Uh, Juan Pablo from uh, CRC. Uh, from our point of view, uh, we would like uh, uh, to see this grow uh, um, on the foundations that uh, have been built uh, on the success stories that we've had uh, uh, with the current versions, and um, uh, uh, take all of that and and make sure that uh, it stays in the next uh, version. And uh, be very careful uh, uh, on changes that uh, might uh, impact uh, uh, and uh, perhaps break uh, uh, compatibility with previous versions uh, down the road. Thank you. Uh, James, Daniela, do you have uh, any thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, sure. So, uh, to reiterate, yeah, the, the SCA Next is, is extremely exciting. I, you know, from our standpoint, um, you know, what we're really interested in is is is, is how it how it evolves as a contract between uh, the, the folks writing code and the folks that test it and and 
and what the specification says so that you know you really can try to get a real contract um, that provides um, more firm guarantees uh, about how, how the code will perform you know portability and and, and performance so you know, that's that's our interest, in, and, and there are a lot of positive things in SBA Next that we see, so uh, it's very exciting. Any other thoughts from the panelists or any questions from the audience? Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for participating. A, a couple of quick announcements before we close the webinar down. Uh, first, we do have a satisfaction survey. We, we'd really like everybody's feedback uh, on the webinar, the webinar series as a whole, and, and this particular webinar. Uh, we want to make these uh, more and more value as, over time, and the, the only way we can do that is if we get feedback from you on what we did right and what we did wrong. Um, the survey link is on the website, and we'll also be sending a thank you uh, to everybody who attended, and uh, we'll have the survey link in there as well so that you can uh, you, you can provide us that feedback. Uh, the next webinar that we'll be holding is on analog to digital converter technology. It's being provided by Spectrum Signal Processing. It's called the ADCs of SDR, and that'll be on August 25th. And then scheduled after that on September 29th is a presentation on cognitive radio networking in the ISM band by John Sidor of CRC. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for your participation. If anybody has any questions they'd like answered uh, offline, feel free to email them to me at lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org, and I'm happy to forward those on to the panelists. And I uh, look forward to seeing you at a uh, future, uh, future webinar that we hold. Thanks again. <laughs>